All right, so uh, I'd like to welcome everyone again on this uh, second part of uh, our QCLIP conference uh, that uh, deals with uh, QKD. And this um, second part will uh, focus on QKD implementation. We have four uh, speakers for this uh, session. The first one will be delivered by Andreas uh, Pope from uh, Austrian Institute of uh, Technology on uh, medical data protection in transit and at rest during the open QKD tested operation in Kratz. The second uh, presentation will be uh, delivered by Andrew Conrad from um, University of Illinois of uh, uh, Urbana-Champaign and uh, we will uh, focus on drone-based uh, quantum key distribution. Uh, the third talk will um, uh, be delivered by uh, Yu Huai Li from um, the University of Science and Technology of China and uh, uh, Shanghai Research Center in quantum, for Quantum Sciences. And uh, the, we will conclude this uh, session with our fourth talk uh, delivered by Matej Pivoluska from, uh, um, uh, for that, from the Institute of Computer Science uh, in uh, Masaryk University at the uh, Czech Republic. So uh, please, at the end of the session, we will have a uh, question, the, the Q&A session. Um, so hold all questions for uh, the end of the session. Feel free to post your question. You're highly encouraged to do so in uh, uh, the Slack uh, page of um, QCRIP, uh, but uh, you can always raise your hand during the uh, the sessions, and then we will um, accommodate for uh, for you to ask your question live. So I give the floor to Andreas Popin now. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. So can you hear me? Yes, Andrea, we can Yes, hear you. okay, yes, good. So, thank you for this kind introduction. My name is Andreas Poppe, as you said, I'm with AIT, and we are the coordinator of this big EU project, OpenQKD. I'm talking about this QKD deployment demonstration with the name medical data protection in transit and at rest during the open QKD uh, testbed operation Graz. Graz is a, a city in Austria and you heard about Graz already today because Graz was, was uh, one of these end station of the intercontinental meteors QKD distribution. But uh, now uh, I go on with open QKD and OpenQKD is uh, uh, this uh, large uh, uh, aim, uh, we aim to really put a lot of different uh, test beds and uh, it's 18 and with more than 50 different use cases uh, across Europe in order to really bring QKD towards the field. We have few already closed use cases in Geneva and now we're ramping up the one in Madrid and in Berlin. But now I'm talking about the medical use case from Graz here. Uh, medical, what does it mean? It all uh, deals with such uh, pictures. Uh, when you uh, look at them first, you would not believe that there's information there because it looks like ciphertext. But these pictures are really important. They, they're produced from the Medical University of Graz. They're also a partner of OpenQKD. And it's about uh, tissue to search for single cancer cells inside uh, these pictures. So this is uh, really needed in order to optimize the drug dose of uh, ill people. Uh, for the demonstration, we took pictures of 30 different patients and send it across Graz. And these pictures are, are called whole slide images and they have really huge resolution because when you 
Look to this a little bit bad zoom. You see here really single cells and this is a cell core and it's really about to find single cells which doesn't belong uh, to this tissue you want to look at but uh, from some other parts of the body. The problem of uh, the medical use uh, medical university was that this picture really overwhelms the data center and one solution they thought about now and we demonstrated recently in OpenQQD was really to split this huge amount of uh, user data in three different shares and not store all shares locally but distribute them in the city of Graz and uh, these boxes uh, based on the Shamir city Secret sharing has the property that you need two different um, shares in order to retrieve the picture. So if the eavesdropper or hacker would steal one of them, it's pretty useless. And as I said, this was demonstrated in the OpenQGD uh, testbed. Uh, we organized it. Uh, the fibers came from Citicom Graz. We needed some encryptors, four pieces from ATFA. We used four QGD systems of Idiquantik and two of Toshiba. When we now go to the uh, map of Graz, is in the eastern part is the medical university, and here the data is produced. Uh, we, uh, one share is stored locally, the other one is distributed over these encryptors uh, to this data center north and data center south. And this encryption uh, was done over the ADFA link and they get all 10 minutes fresh key from the QKD system. So we, uh, we, uh, uh, we distributed uh, the data, we retrieved it from the medical university, but also we enabled some other doctors like in the hospital cards to deliver a second opinion uh, to these pictures or if the patient was then in order to get uh, some request. We first uh, demonstrated in the lab, uh, this is a picture of the dry run of the op optical network and we, uh, we wanted to go fast out to the deployment and of course this uh, it's a little bit uh, bad the picture but nevertheless you see in the first two weeks we really had a big we had some problems with some devices, then we could solve them over three to four weeks. The four Idiquantik devices were running nicely in the field. It was over the new year of this year and their Brexit happened and uh, the devices coming from UK had a little bit uh, delay and then uh, were only this uh, short time in our network. So this was it more or less. I go back uh, to this slide and uh, say thank you. All right, thank you very much, Andrea, uh, for this uh, brief introduction to the work that is happening within OpenQKD project. Um, please post your questions in the uh, Slack uh, page and uh, we will now proceed with um, Andrea's Conrad uh, Andrew Conrad uh, on the second talk. Um, yeah, thank you for your time. Uh, so today I'm excited to talk to you about drone-based quantum key distribution. Uh, this is a collaborative event between the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and the Ohio State University, led by our fearless principal investigator, Professor Paul Quiat, and our co-PI, Professor Dan Gauthier. So as you're probably aware, drones are being increasingly used in our modern society, and they're being trusted with more important jobs as time goes on, in particular, taxiing humans with drone taxis, as well as package delivery. Uh, just this last year, uh, COVID-19 was successfully delivered, uh, the vaccine was delivered using drones in a limited trial run. Unfortunately, drones are susceptible to different types of attack vectors that are more pronounced without humans in the loop, uh, in particular, signal spoofing and denial of service attacks. 
We're optimistic that uh, quantum approaches such as QKD can provide improved security for protecting future drone constellations uh, going forward. Uh, so we're seeking to be the first group to demonstrate drone-based quantum key distribution. Uh, here is what our drone looks like. It's the DJI S1000 Plus drone. And I'm gonna be going over a few of our critical subsystems. Uh, the first most important subsystem is our actual QKD source. Uh, we partnered with collaborators at Ohio State University to develop a resonant cavity-based QKD source. Uh, and it uses uh, three different resonant cavity uh, LEDs. And it uses the right and left circular basis of polarization for encoding our QKD states. Uh, and then it uses the HV basis for air checking. Now, you need really good spectral and temporal overlap to reduce uh, side channel attacks. So this is uh, what the spectral overlap looks like. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about this, you should check out post, the poster session, uh, poster session 209 in more details. Uh, in addition to good spectral overlap, uh, we were able to achieve a good uh, temporal overlap, as you can see in this photo or in this plot here, both for our signal and our decoy uh, states. And we were able to achieve 12.5 megahertz repetition rate with a Cuber performance of 1% in the left-right basis and 2% in the HV basis. Now on the drones, size, weight, and power are severely limited. Uh, so we ended up opting for a custom 3D printed uh, optical bench, both for our transmitter and our receiver. Here's kind of an overview of what our TX bench looks like. Um, we have state preparation. Uh, it goes through some pre-compensation and then a spatial uh, mode or single mode fiber provides a good spatial filter uh, before it goes through a dichroic mirrors and out of our fast steering mirrors. Now, one of the challenges is providing a stable line of sight between both drones while they're in flight dealing with the random turbulence. So to do that, we have both an inner and outer control loop. The outer control loop provides course alignment while the inner control loop provides fine alignment. Here's kind of an overview of what the inner control loop looks like. It uses counter-propagating laser beacons, fast steering mirrors, and a position-sensitive diode. Uh, here's kind of a zoomed-in photo of what our position-sensitive diode looks like. And here is a short uh, set point tracking video. Uh, we're tracing out a four by four grid array and uh, the PSD and the, fine, and the, fine, the fast steering mirrors are providing closed loop control in order to adjust uh, the position accordingly to the set point. Uh, so we characterize our performance on the ground uh, and uh, with different configurations of our control loop, either being turned on or turned off. Uh, and as you can see, if we turn off the control loops, our locking degrades down to the noise floor, uh, but we achieve the best possible, uh, the, the, the lowest possible channel loss in our configuration with both the inner and outer control loops turned on. Uh, so here's what our uh, locking is with both drones in the air. This was taken at a distance of around 10 meters apart. And we were able to achieve an average channel loss of around 27 dB over a 10 minute duration. Uh, we use uh, off commercial off the shelf single photon detectors and we put together a custom made FPGA that provides uh, time tagging abilities for our detected photons. Uh, and we also came up with a custom software-based time synchronization protocol uh, to provide uh, time synchronization between the two drones while they're in flight. And if you're more interested uh, in learning more, you should check out session, uh, the poster session, uh, poster number 192. Uh, so here's kind of an overview of our quantum drone team. Again, our principal investigator is Professor Paul Quiat, and our co-PA is Professor Dan Gauthier. Uh, I just want to say thank you for your time, and I look forward to chatting more and getting your questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Andrew, for this um, very interesting talk. Uh, can we please now move to our next uh, speaker? Again, please uh, post your questions to uh, Slack. So I'd like to welcome Wu Hui Li. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Yu Huai Li from University of Science and Technology of China. I'm glad to be here to make my presentation about our experiment of free space MDI QKD. 
Since the excellent realistic security, MDIQD has been rapidly developed for these years. However, all these previous works were performed over fiber channels. Due to the high loss in long distance fiber channels, it is not suitable for a large scale uh, application. So for a global, global scale quantum network, uh, demon, uh, MDI, uh, demonstrating MDIQD in free space is required. Different from fiber channel, the atmospheric turbulence in free space channel makes it difficult to guarantee the optical pulse indistinguishability. We developed a series of technicals such as adaptive, adaptive optics to improve the signal model, uh, single model fiber coupling efficiency and uh, independent uh, clock synchronization and independent laser frequency locking to ensure the indistinguishability in time and wavelength domain. Based on this, we have performed an MDI QQD experiment with nearly 20 kilometers of free space channel. This work has, has been published uh, in PRL last year. The detailed information can be found in the online video. After the first demonstration of long distance free space MDI QQD, we further focus on how to really build a practical global scale network. Here we summarized the main challenges of satellite-based global application. The first problem that free space is lossy and unstable channel has been experimentally verified in our last work. So we further considered the remaining three challenges, including high background noise at the light, the fast moving of the light, and how to connect large numbers or a large number of nodes to build a network. Here in the short live presentation, I will go in to show some of our very re recent uh, results. Normally, due to the high background noise caused by sunlight, we need very narrow band filter, such as FP cavities or black gratings to increase the signal to noise ratio when performing QQD in daylight, uh, making the system complicated. Uh, however, with MDI protocol, it is possible to remove these filters. Here we can show a simple comparison between BB84 protocol and the symmetrical MDI with perfect single photon, single photon sources. We can see from the figure that at, at the same total channel efficiency, the cuber increases very slow with the dark count in MDI protocol, uh, the, the yellow curve. That is because the coincidence measurement in MDI QQD can rule out most of the background noises. With a star type network, uh, there is a very important advantage that the center, the center node can be untrusted with MDI protocol. And with telecom wave band, the connection between client and the server node is flexible. It can be fiber, ground-based ground -based free space, or satellite-based free space, so that the network con construction can be very flexible. The fast moving satellite introduced new technical challenges. The high speed of satellite affect the arrival time of optical, band, uh, optical pulses, and the Doppler frequency shift affect the indistinguishability of wavelength. These effects can be predicted by the prediction or measurement of the satellite and then compensated in real time. With laser ranging technical, the determination of distance can achieve a precision of about a one centimeter corresponding to a time precision of 30 picosecond. The, de the determination of speed can also achieve a one centimeter per second, corresponding to a frequency shift of 6.5 kilohertz. The product of delta T and delta F is far below one, so that this accuracy is enough for a high visibility home random inference. So based on this, recently we performed a free space and fiber hybrid network demonstration, a demonstration of MDI at the, light, at, at the daylight. We construct two free space channels and a fiber channel. With a high background noise and the channel loss, we demonstrate that security key can also uh, can, can even be extracted with a full intensity decoy state MDI protocol. However, uh, under the same condition, BB84 protocol were not working even with perfect single potent source. We performed the experiment, uh, experiment from 8 a.m. to 17 p.m. 
the security key rate in each hour is shown in the bar figure. Uh, since the atmospheric turbulence significantly affect the visibility of home mandos interference. Here we need to apply a post-selection method that only choose detection events that's corresponding to a similar channel efficiencies so that the, the, the security key rate can be further increased at, uh, as the blue bars. We also performed a network demonstration uh, that shows uh, the result in, in here. So uh, two of the three encoding nodes are selected by optical switches to perform the MDI QVD. Uh, this manuscript of this work is being presentation. Uh, so uh, we, we demonstrated that uh, a, a, high, a, a high background noise toler tolerance of MDI and suitable for star type network with untrusted delay. Uh, it shows that MDI QVD or even TF QVD uh, with set light is visible. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Wu Hai Li. Um, uh, I suggest we proceed to our last uh, speaker. So I would like to welcome Matej Pivoluska. Thank you. Um, this is a short version of the talk that was uploaded. It's called Pathways for Entanglement Based Quantum Communication in the Phase of High Noise. This is uh, some theory work about high dimensional entanglement based QKD with an implementation using path entanglement. Um, here's a slide that will just show you um, everything you need to know about this implementation, small technical details, because there are lots of kinds of QKD. So I figured this is important for many of you. So what we do here is implement an high dimensional QKD. That means we are using QDITs. This is entanglement based. We use discrete variables and we use trusted devices. We calculate asymptotic key rates. And our main motivation is to increase the noise resistance of QKD protocols. Um, here's the protocol we actually implement. This is a relatively new protocol that uh, some of us co authored earlier this year. This is a QKD with subspace encoding. The idea is to use a D times D dimensional entangled quantum system to perform multiple instances of a QKD protocol simultaneously in non-overlapping subspaces of size K. And uh, the protocol uses, uh, well, the protocol goes like this. First of all, you assume that you um, distribute an entangled state row AB, which ideally would be a D times D entangled, maximal entangled state of this form here. Uh, and then there are two types of measurements chosen at random for both Alice and Bob. Uh, one of them is computational basis measurement. And another one, which we call a test measurement is a subspace mutually unbiased measurement. You can see that I've split it in this example of D4 and K2, the whole Hilbert space into two subspaces. One of the, each of them of size two, it's the red subspace and the blue subspace. And uh, the whole idea or the whole trick of the protocol is that in step three, you only keep results in which both results of Alice and Bob were achieved in the same subspace. So for example, if Alice measures zero in the computational basis and Bob measures two, these are not in the same subspace. So these are simply discarded. And then you will be able to understand also the test measurement, because you can see this is just subspace mutually unbiased measurement. So in each of these subspaces, you measure a mutually unbiased basis to the computational one. Then key rate fraction, which means key rate per photon is calculated simply as logarithm of K, which is the total alphabet of the subspace, the subspace size minus error vector in both of the uh, bases, uh, EK, simply means that you, this is a vector of probabilities of having no error or the results differing by one or the results of Bob and Alice differing by two and so on. And ET is the same thing for the test measurement. You might notice that for qubits, this will simply become a traditional uh, quashi preskill style um, key rate calculation. So, Here's our implementation using path entanglement. Uh, the whole idea is that the laser 
is first split into eight parts. Uh, co this is a coherent pump. And then these eight parts, because photons can live in superposition of these eight parts, pump the BBO crystal. There, the down conversion happens and you get idler and signal photons, which are now entangled also in this path of degree of freedom. This is then split and sent to Alice and Bob. So Alice gets a signal photon, which can come in one of the eight parts and Bob gets the idler photon, which also can come in one of the eight paths. And then you have this measurement apparatus, which basically is using half-wave plates to manipulate these paths before they are detected uh, in detectors. The main idea here, again, is that, or you can split this. So totally, we you can see we have eight detectors on Alice's side and simil similarly on Bob's side. But uh, you can use smaller dimensional ETD if you simply forget some of the paths. So if you forget the green part here, then you are using a D equals four state with only these red paths here. And similarly, you can use just a two dimensional state in total. Last but not least, there are these little light bulbs, which are LEDs placed into in front of each coupler. These are used to introduce the extra noise because we want to study noise resistance. So this is our means of changing the channel. And uh, we implement this in multiple settings. So we try different values of DNK and calculate the key rates and compare them in the next slide. So it turns out that it really matters um, what kind of noise you have in mind for comparison. So first of all, you can do isotropic noise, where this is a traditional theory kind of noise. This white noise, so with probability P, you get the signal as it gets produced by the photons. And with probability one minus P, you get a completely white noise. And there you can see the first results, right? There are these lines, which are theory we have for this. And the dots are the actual key rates we obtained. And you can see that as expected with K4 protocols, you start kind of by 1.4 bits per photon of key rate after post-processing for K equal two protocols, you start with uh, 0.8. And then if you start adding noise, these kind of like go away from each other. And you can easily observe that higher total dimension D helps with the noise resistance. You get more key rate at first. Later, however, you can see that the most noise resistant setup was D8K2, which means the total dimensionality was eight and the subspace size was two. However, you might argue that this is not a fair comparison. And the reason for this is that isotropic noise kind of dilutes, um, dilutes the extra photons that enter the system. So for isotropic noise level P, you have to shine different intensities of these noise LEDs on detectors, which means that for D equals eight, you actually shine less light on each individual detector than for D equals four. So we also took a look what happens if this is not the case. And here, this is the detector noise part where you shine exactly the same amount of photons on each of the detectors. Remember in D8, you have more detectors than D4 and the whole advantage disappears. And this just tells you that this is a bad kind of noise. And there definitely is part of the noise in the real noise that has this type uh, thing, just dark counts. But we suppose this is not going to be prevalent because these are typically constant. You should not have too much light in your lab such that all the detectors get illuminated in the same way. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, there's channel noise where you get extra singles per laboratory. And this is consistent with free space implementations where the extra photons come from the environment outside. They first come through the telescope to your system and then they get deleted into eight parts before getting detected. That's why you can see that the advantage of high dimensional protocols is even more pronounced. And last but not least, uh, what we comment on in the paper that for this path entanglement setup, there is an additional advantage and that in fact, you can pump the crystal with more stronger powers 
if you increase the dimensions. And the reason for this is that BBO crystal heating limits the power and practice you can use because eventually you burn your BBO crystal. But if you first split uh, the laser into multiple paths, the crystal gets heated more evenly and you can create stronger entanglement, um, stronger entanglement source with more pairs per second. And you can see that this happens actually, you can see it in key rate per second as opposed to key rate per photon, where these lines further divide and D equal eight, the red lines kind of jump higher above the green and blue lines would represent lower dimensionalities. With this, I would like to thank you and invite you to ask questions. So I would like to thank uh, Matej and in fact, I would like to thank all of our speakers for their brilliant talks, a very interesting topics. Um, we have a couple of uh, questions from uh, uh, the audience uh, going to Andrew. They are similar or the first one focuses on uh, where the contribution to the losses comes from. Uh, is it the beam tracking um, or the frequency vari variation from the drone? And um, uh, the second one uh, focus on, on what is the limit on the maximum distance between uh, the drones to provide the positive uh, secret key rate. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for your question. Uh, those are both great questions. Yeah, so our current understanding of the max contributing um, factor to uh, the link loss between the two drones uh, is the essentially the high frequency vibrations of the drones themselves. Uh, the drones that we're using are just commercial off the shelf drones and uh, we're pushing them at their max payload capacity. Uh, to keep them in the air. And they're also a fairly bit older drones and the vibrations that they, they have essentially uh, apply slight rotations to the line of sight, which causes um, a channel loss down, down link. So uh, to, to get around that, we are working to improve uh, the bandwidth of our inner control loop to better stabilize that. Uh, as far as the We've done a lot of work, uh, you know, with the drones fairly close, uh, but we expect that we can get, we can move the drones out to uh, a few hundred uh, meters as what we're working towards. And we think in the limiting case, uh, we can get out to like potentially maybe a kilometer. But ultimately, the, um, the limiting factor on the ultimate performance of uh, distance is essentially uh, how well we can collimate our light and um, basically uh, providing good timing synchronization between the two, uh, to the two drones. Um, yeah, th thank you. Thank you for your question. Great. I have a follow up on this. So you mentioned uh, initially that your motivation behind this work is that um, uh, the drone communication is accessible to, to DOS, to denial of service attacks. And for that, you consider QKD as an option to secure uh, the links, but how vulnerable is the QKD itself, particularly when we're talking about uh, free space uh, QKD. Uh, yeah, that's something that also Wu Hai Li can, uh, can uh, comment. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. So we have, a, we have multiple motivations for our work. Um, so two of the ones that I highlighted were denial of service uh, attacks, as well as just securing the links. Uh, and I do agree that QKD is susceptible to certain types of denial of service attacks. Um, however, in the, in the realm of drones, um, most of the communications are done with RF and most of the sensing is done over RF with GPS as well. And uh, just with the, the, uh, the large prevalence of RF jammers um, is what causes a lot of problems in the drone community. So having a point to point link uh, that uses uh, single photons um, with an optical line of sight, uh, at least that is a bit more uh, resilient against denial of service attacks for uh, at least the attack vectors that typically um, manifest themselves at drones. But yeah, I do agree with you. Fundamentally, there are still uh, weaknesses uh, with QKD in the sense that it can be uh, ultimately suffer from certain types of denial of service attacks. But we find that those types of attacks are typically require more sophistication from the attackers than just using an RF jammer. All right. 
Good. So it's actually shifting from, from RF vulnerability to uh, uh, optical, if you like. Um, and how difficult it is to, we've seen all these um, uh, very interesting and high-tech high um, uh, components, the, the, the uh, pointing acquisition and tracking, the time synchronization, all the subsystems uh, together operating. But how difficult is it to integrate uh, all these in a single uh, operational system? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so part of part of the challenge is that we have we're very limited on our size, weight, and power on the drone, and we've had to take great care in order to provide isolation between our critical subsystems and the systems of the drone themselves. Uh, for instance, the drone has its own magnetic sensors, um, and we found that when we have our components too close to that, it causes uh, navigational errors of the drones, uh, which is which is not a good which is not a good thing. Conversely, uh, the large amount of power and the, the large amount of current traveling in the wires, also we found that that interferes with some of our precision high, high speed um, signal lines such as our PSD. So we've had to take enormous care, uh, you know, doing, putting together an integration solution that essentially protects us from interfering with the drone and the drone from interfering with our systems uh, in order to essentially achieve operation. All right, thank you, thank you, Andrew. Uh, we have another question to Mates. Uh, why not use PPKTP crystals to improve entanglement? Thank you for your question. Uh, unfortunately, I feel not qualified to answer because I was not very involved with the experimental part of this work. Uh, I did the theory. Good. So maybe uh, you can comment on another aspect uh, that is uh, similar. Um, how would you um, compare the high dimensional entanglement and the, the generation for high dimensional entanglement uh, to use it for, um, for uh, 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 entanglement links? So let me rephrase. In fact, we've seen uh, you compare the, the, the qubits entanglement, the secret key rate for, uh, for uh, two dimensional with uh, higher dimensions, and the, the bit rate uh, is um, higher. Uh, but does that consider or include uh, the fidelity that one cannot see, for example, in high dimensional uh, uh, entanglement systems? Definitely, I don't think this is an issue in the setup because if you because this would kind of require you to compare to other kind of entanglement in, in different degrees of freedom. And I argue, and I agree with you that, that the conventional qubit QKD setups definitely must outperform the path one. But using the path entanglement in two dimensional systems, I don't think you can get much better than we have seen. In fact, like from the graphs, you might notice that before we started adding the noise, this was done with, with the top of the line components so like nano wire detectors and everything. So the data was almost too perfect before we started adding the noise. So the quality there, uh, does not improve much. Of course, it's a good question. What would happen if you are using cheaper components? Because then you will get more prevalent uh, dark counts. And I commented on the fact that this definitely is the worst kind of noise we know of. And when using eight dimensional system, you have eight detectors, not two detectors per side. So definitely would feel it more. And Therefore, this really there are a couple of questions of like, and that's actually the next step for this kind of protocol. Try to see if we can do it with like less perfect devices, and see how this influences um, the whole key rate. And yes. I argue with you. I agree with your intuition that it can be expected that high dimensional QKD will probably lose some of its advantage. So a, a similar topic coming from the audience again is um, uh, using the SLM to generate the different OEM modes for the photons. Uh, what is the visibility uh, that you get from these um, different OEM values? Um, again, sorry, this is this is an experimental question. Yeah. Uh, the visibility was very high, though. Um, I. And like without 
I can look it up in the data, but I feel like the visibility in every dimension was way over 95%. Because, um, but this is again, because the components, especially the detectors were, were like the top of the line. So you could, you could get really good visibilities before we started adding noise using the LEDs. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, I, I have uh, a couple more questions. I don't know if I should proceed or maybe do it in the, the networking session. So um, for Wu uh, Hui Li, uh, I, I was curious to, I, I mean, you demonstrated the 19 kilometer and that's already a significant achievement, but what, what was the main uh, contribution from that uh, for that limitation. I've seen that you use the adaptive optics and you've improved uh, the you, you achieved an ATB uh, improvement uh, on uh, on the um, uh, performance of, of 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 the link. But uh, was it this or was it the synchronization issues and the the, the frequency um, adjustments? Uh, so the, the the adaptive optics mainly uh, uh, increased the the link efficiency and uh, uh, and uh, narrows the the deviation of the the the, uh, the intensity fluctuation so that we can uh, achieve a better interference uh, uh, a better home mental uh, interference visibility and since the the the, the free space link the free space link is unstable. Uh, it is uh, difficult for us to share uh, standard frequency lasers or standard clock, clock reference. Uh, so we need uh, to develop new uh, techniques about uh, independent clock in uh, synchronization and in independent uh, frequency uh, laser frequency locking. Right. Uh, uh, and one last one for, for uh, Andreas. So Andreas, you um, uh, reported on, on a real life implementation of uh, QKD. So this is actually the holy grail. Um, what are the main challenges when getting into the real life from the QKD system perspective? Yeah, uh, so I really conclude with the industry session here. Uh, I mean, it's cost, right? Uh, so uh, the, the use cases need, of course, uh, a low amount uh, of uh, or have already a uh, low amount of money because really it's uh, what is the add-on of QKD and one needs to, to design uh, that from case to case and of course in our case we have a dedicated QKD system for each link right in future you have a big QKD network over the city and you ask the network to provide uh, this key and the use case in future will be a little bit uncritical because the cost of the QKD system will distribute uh, on, on many users. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I guess that uh, this makes total sense and is perfect alignment with uh, the industrial session discussion indeed. Um, if there are no more questions, uh, we can uh, conclude this session, I guess. Uh, please uh, feel free to meet our uh, speakers uh, and discuss further whatever questions you may have uh, on the Meet Anyway tool that um, uh, QCrypt is uh, providing. And uh, thank you very much for attending the session.